Hello and welcome to White Swan, the podcast that gives you the inside story on how leaders tackle crises. I'm Gavin McGaw, and on this podcast, we aim to furnish you with the learnings behind the headlines so that when the proverbial hits the fan, you can keep things turning. On this episode of White Swan, we're going to be joined by Richard Wilson, the former cabinet secretary and the most senior civil servant in the United Kingdom when Tony Blair was prime minister. Richard has been the guy in effect running the country at key moments. He also sat round the cabinet table for vital moments in our history. In my interview, we chat about 9-11 and the steps that were taken at the heart of government once it became clear it was a terrorist attack. I'm joined by Karen White of National in Canada and Gary Cleland of Hanover in the UK. Welcome, Karen and Gary. Hi, Gav. Hi, Gav. Now, Richard was incredibly interesting to chat to and great fun as well. It felt like he was putting us in the room at times uh, for those key moments in history and learning how number 10 Downing Street functioned on that awful day of 11th of September 2001 was really, really interesting. I'm sure, like me, you both remember what, where you were on that day, and I was working in Westminster and was genuinely shocked to see uh, events unfold. But Richard talked about the vital role that Cobra played in pulling together people physically in one place. And as I think he says in the interview, stopping them running around like headless chickens in a crisis. Uh, and that is something that works well, not only for governments, but for any organization. Karen, how have you seen people effectively pulled together, uh, whether it's component parts of a business or different teams in a crisis, either physically or virtually, to ensure a coordinated response? Yeah, I think with the onset of the pandemic, I've actually seen more virtual crisis rooms or emergency response in operations. I think traditionally some of our clients have preferred to be physically in the room and have actually required this. Uh, but it's a great relief, actually, to see how the pandemic has normalized the virtual meetings. It makes it much more efficient to bring expertise and people together from your crisis response. I think this has been particularly true for organizations that have operations across several regions uh, with their leadership team or subject matter experts located in different areas. But I think regardless of where your operations center is located, whether it's virtual or in person, Having those core roles and responsibilities defined in advance, clear activation protocols and setting expectations for when the initial situation or sit rep or briefing is happening, it's critically important in order to set your incident up for success. You know, I really like to have those initial checklists prepared in advance so you have some guidance about initial priorities and thinking and also who should be in the room and a part of your response. You know, as we know, crisis never rolls out exactly like we plan, but if you have the right structure, you have roles clarified, you know who to bring together, I think that goes a long way in order to support your response. Gary, have you seen a similar trend with COVID leading to more virtual rooms? Yes, I think, I think inevitably more and more organizations are being forced to operate virtually. I think what's interesting in considering who to bring into the room um, is who are those right people? I think one of the things that I have found that can be exacerbated in a virtual world when people aren't all operating in the same building is the fact that one of the often one of the weakest points in an organization's crisis response setup is the gap between the people who are making the decisions and then the people who are executing the decision. Uh, and that's something which is exacerbated whenever you can't just run from the crisis room and grab the person that you want to speak to. Often we work with organizations to create a two-tiered setup working together, one with the seniority and oversight to set the strategic direction of response and one which is tasked with the tactical execution. And one of the crucial points to test when you review your crisis protocol is how those two groups share information with each other. What you don't want to do is spend all of your time thinking about how to get the CEO and the C-suite all into a room and actually forget about how you communicate with the person who's actually running your social media account, because that's where you start to trip up. Yeah, I think what you've just said, out, Gary, is particularly important for those highly regulated industries where you tend to have the C-suite or the leadership team in one part and then the operational response team in another. Uh, and I think that's a fascinating example. All right, now let's hear from Richard. Richard. 
Each episode of White Swan features an in-depth conversation with leaders so you get to learn about their crisis experience and the lessons you need to hear. We're returning to the world of politics for this interview, but it's not really a politician. I'm delighted to be joined by Baron Wilson of Dinton, a member of the British House of Lords. But you may know Richard Wilson better as a former cabinet secretary, and that is a very big role at the heart of government. Richard was the most senior civil servant in the United Kingdom and was a senior policy advisor to the prime minister and cabinet. And as secretary of the cabinet was less responsible for the efficient and effective running of the government. Richard served several prime ministers whilst in senior civil service roles, including Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair. And after retiring as cabinet secretary, he took up a number of roles in business, including acting as a non-executive director at B-Sky B and as chairman of a private bank. He was also, of course, elevated to the House of Lords. Richard, thank you so much for joining me on White Swan. Very good to be here. Thank you, Richard. Now, Richard, you have sat around the table for some of the biggest moments in this country's recent history. Talk us through how you ended up becoming Britain's eighth cabinet secretary. I suppose I don't really know the answer to that question or the other answer I do know is to tell you about my life story, which would take longer than this podcast. Um, but I basically, I've been a lucky man. I'm a lucky guy. Uh, I've had a series of demanding jobs through my career. Each time they gave me a difficult job to do, I thought, oh my goodness, I can't do this. I stretched myself. I did it. It went all right. And they then said, here's another job, even more demanding. And then I found myself as cabinet secretary. So I dealt with, um, I, I was in charge of energy policy through the miners' strike and the quadrupling of the oil price. I was in charge of nuclear power policy the last time we ordered nuclear power stations. I did one of Mrs. Thatcher's early privatizations, uh, which set the course, helped set the course. I was in charge of the economic and domestic secretariat of the cabinet office under Mrs. Thatcher when she was doing a r large number of major radical changes. Uh, whoops, you used to think each week, there goes Ilya, whoops, there goes the health service, whoops, there goes the curriculum. Every week there was something big. I worked in the Treasury, then I was made Permanent Secretary of Environment, moved then to Permanent Secretary of the Home Office, and then Cabinet Secretary under Tony Blair. These are big roles. And, you know, Cabinet Secretary role is a massive one. It has many facets, including overseeing the civil service, ensuring the Cabinet is functioning properly, which is a tough job in itself. And also when you were in the role, overseeing the intelligence services and their relationship with government. How on earth do you juggle so many responsibilities in a role? Well, I, th I ask myself that quite often. I don't know the answer to it. How on earth could you have done all those things? I couldn't do them now. But the answer is, when you have a career, the kind I've been lucky to have, you get into training, uh, you stretch yourself, you have the adrenaline running. And I think you really get into a, a mode of kind of fitness not physical fitness, but mental fitness, where you are able to deal with all these things and all the time select what you're going to do. I remember thinking, it's very like surfing. You have to keep your balance and all the time you have to make judgments, quick judgments, uh, and not fall off and try and get as many of the judgments right as you can without spending too long dithering over them. And that's how you do it. You select what's important, you hope you've got the right selection uh, and you sometimes miss, but more often than not, you've got to be on the ball because otherwise you'll fall off. Now, you were also trying to raise a family at this point, Richard, whilst you were doing the biggest role in government. I mean, some of our listeners are senior business leaders and they'll want to know what the inside track is for doing all of this. What's your secret? Well, my secret was I got a lovely wife who was very supportive uh, and we both sorted out the bits of the week that we would protect for the family. So we used to have, we used to go to the movies quite often on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, we used to have an evening watching, if we didn't do that, we used to have an evening with a takeaway meal and watching a film. Uh, we used to have Sunday lunch. Sunday lunch is sacrosanct. So that when Mr. Blair rang one day uh, at 10 to one on Sunday, my daughter answered the phone and then shouted out, Dad, it's the Prime Minister. Mum says it's 10 minutes to lunch, so don't be long. And Mr Blair got the message. And you have to protect your time. 
and then uh, in the evening, I used to do work around tea time, but sort of before the children went to bed, depending on their age, we would play games, board games, card games, whatever. Uh, and I used those periods, I, w- I would say to anyone, really, I- I'm sorry, I've got this is family time, I can't break it now. But you do miss out. And a lot of my time as cabinet secretary coincided with my children being teenagers. And I can remember getting home at, what, nine, ten at night, and my daughter, teenager, coming out into the hall, uh, taking my coat off, exhausted after a long day, saying, Dad, Michael Howard has just said X. How can you let him say something like that? And you're, you know, so you don't ever escape. But we've been having our grandchildren with us um, uh, recently, and um, I've been very conscious being with them 24 hours, how much my wife coped with that I missed out on through the day when they were arguing or needing feeding or whatever. Uh, And so the answer is you do have a trade-off, but if you want a family life, you have to have a good structure, an agreement between yourselves about how you're going to be available some of the times that they know you and how you're going to be uh, coping with the stresses on you. Well, that's, those are some good rules, Richard, for avoiding family crises uh, when you're in busy jobs. Now, look, White Swan is all about crises, and you'll have seen your fair share. Just talking about your background, we have heard numerous things, whether it's minor strike, whether it's working for Tony Blair and 9-11. But how do you identify the difference between a crisis and just a standard issue? Do you have a sort of process, uh, whether uh, whether it's an actual process or whether it's just subliminally how you work these things through for doing so? It depends on uh, how many people are affected. If you're working in Westminster, it's a small world of its own. And you can have what feels like a crisis in Westminster without the rest of the country being much affected by it. And the public know that. They they watch and they say, uh-oh, politics. And they don't, they're not that interested or impressed. They don't follow it that closely unless they're kind of um, people who like that sort of thing. Whereas a real crisis is one where the, where, um, the community, the wider community of the British public are involved and possibly the international community. And sometimes in government, you can, you can get the two confused. If you are dealing with a minister or a prime minister who's been the subject of a media um, firestorm, Dealing with them is like dealing with someone who is in, has been in hospital and needs a few days to recover. They, 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 it's very hard not to be affected by it. So that internally, it feels like a crisis. But actually, a bit of you needs always to think, is this about Westminster uh, and politics and who's going to win the next election? Or is it about something that affects the whole community where you've got a problem which you people you know in other parts of the country would notice and be worried about? And those are real crises. There'll be a lot of people listening to this, Richard, wondering what your advice is, though, for convincing, in your case, prime ministers and for them, CEOs, that they maybe need to change their approach to a crisis to understand the real context rather than the personal context. Because often people respond poorly because it's personal. You're absolutely right. and This is where it's about relationships. Uh, you can't really be effective as a civil servant unless and until you are within, I, I used to think, within the stockade. I don't know where I got that from. But they have to be convinced you're on their side. You can only really hope to be heard if people listen to you and want to hear what you're saying rather than saying, yeah, yeah, he's just being a civil servant giving advice. Boring, boring. You have to be inside the camp. And if you could do that, if you can actually say, Prime Minister, I think we've got a real problem here. And I think it's one the public are worried about. If they trust you, they will listen. Mrs. Thatcher actually was very good at that. She, and I think Blair, Mr. Blair was too, they both of them had a confidence in their ability to read the public mood, which um, went way beyond Westminster and politics. And I've seen Mrs. Thatcher listening to her colleagues all flapping about something and saying to them, I know, but actually um, this is not something that the public are worried about. And I can remember Mr. Blair, she would sniff the air and know what the C's and D's were 
but actually thinking. And Mr. Blair would do the same. I can remember talking to him about some problem. And he'd say, I know, Richard, but actually this is not what they're talking about in the dog and duck. This is not something that people outside Westminster are bothered about. And so usually people who've got to the top have got that awareness. But even so, there are times when you need to draw this distinction between the Westminster bubble and the real world. That's really interesting because in business, they, we talk about insight to your audiences, understanding how an audience is going to react and what they're going to be thinking. And what you're saying is some of those most successful prime ministers this country has had have had that inbuilt. They've understood how things are going to go down. Uh, and they are always tuning in, watching what the rest of the world is thinking. Mind you, from time to time, they too get caught up in the Westminster world. And the role is reversed. And you're saying to them, listen, I know this seems big to you today, but actually it isn't as big as you think. No one outside Westminster is going to worry about it. And they look at you and they think as if, but they're wrong. The truth is an awful lot of what happens in the Westminster world lasts for a day or three days and is then over. Richard, you ended up being cabinet secretary and you were a cabinet secretary on the infamous day of the 11th of September 2001 when terrorists tragically murdered nearly 3,000 people in New York. How did that crisis play out in Downing Street? Um, it was a very frightening afternoon, if I'm honest with you, um, because we didn't know the effect, how far we were going to be affected by it. I was, it was a perfectly normal morning. Uh, I had lunch uh, with someone in Victoria. It was not far away. And um, when I finished lunch, about two-ish, uh, I went out to my car. I had a car. I was a lucky man. I had a, a government driver. And as I got in the car, he said to me, an aeroplane has, has flown into the World Trade Center. At that time, it was just one plane. And I knew that a plane had had a near miss in New York before, an amateur plane. So I said, uh, that sounds like an amateur plane, but let's put the radio on. And we drove back. And as we drove, we heard that a second plane had, had flown into the other World Trade Center. And suddenly um, we realized that this is a serious terrorist act. And number 10 rang me. We had a phone in the car. Remember, this is before mobiles, uh, as they are, as we know them. And number said, um, we've heard that the White House may be going to evacuate. Should we evacuate number 10? And I said, if you evacuate, where do you go to? And they said, we're not sure. And I said, let's not, it's good rule. If you don't know where you're going to evacuate to, don't evacuate. Because I had an image of all the special advisors on the pavement with their laptops. And it was, um, it would be a bad picture. And I, as soon as I, got, there's traffic in Parliament Square. As soon as we got back, uh, I went from my office round to number 10, which is a quick walk. And we discussed what to do because the Prime Minister Mr. Blair uh, was in Brighton about to address the Trade Union Congress. Uh, and um, so uh, and a surprising number of ministers were out of London. It was, it was before the party conference, after the holidays, and people were using it to get out of London. Um, and um, uh, they said, what do we do? And I said, let's have a meeting of COBRA, which at that, by then I had learnt in a crisis, what you need to do to, is say to people, we will meet at a given place, uh, and everyone knew what their roles were. They knew the drill. It gives people something to hold on to. Uh, and I said, we'll have a meeting of COBRA at 4.30. We'll ring the Prime Minister now, get him back. Uh, and that was a couple, we gave him a couple of hours. Uh, get him back, and then we'll have a meeting of COBRA, and we will tell Whitehall. And there are a number of other things we need to do. We need to alert everybody and make sure everybody is responding in the way we need to before we do that. And I went back to my office and I had a lovely private office who are young people who are very supportive. Um, and I, we drew up a list of all the people we needed to look after and make sure were on the ball, knew what was going on, because you know it came out of nowhere, this. Uh, beginning with Her Majesty the Queen, uh, make sure she was safe. Parliament, of course, wasn't sitting, uh, but make, I had images of a plane going into Big Ben and uh, make sure the speaker was okay and that Parliament was, I don't know what I expected them to do, but they were alert. Um, and then the intelligence agencies, the police, the Metropolitan Police, the Ministry of Defence, uh, who um, immediately uh, needed to get um, planes flying over London to, you know, to head off any terrorist attack. Uh, we needed to get the Department of Transport were crucially important. 
uh, ringing them up and making sure they were closing down small airports so that no one could take off from those airports and heightening security at Heathrow and Gatwick. And also, they rang me and said, um, we've come across a problem. Uh, we think the City of London Airport is a real, um, really um, vulnerable place because it would be a good place for terrorists to target and then to fly straight into the City of London targets. We want to close it down. Uh, lawyers are looking at our powers to do that, but it's going to take some time. We'd like to close them now because, you know, it's immediate. Uh, and um, I said, look, let's close it. We'll close it and discuss it later, whether we've got the power to do it, what our powers are. And they closed it, which I think was a good thing to do. And anyway, we got hold of Mr. Blair while all this is happening. We were watching on the screen, uh, on the television screen in my office, uh, what was happening. Uh, and uh, it was horrible, actually horrible, watching the, the Trade Centre towers collapsing and looking out of the window and wondering if a plane was going to come screeching down the, into Buckingham Palace or into, into the um, central government. And uh, we, we were very conscious all the time uh, of the need to get the prime minister back. We rang him up and he was terrific, very interesting. Whereas I was completely preoccupied with London and safety and airports and, you know, the big cities. He immediately said, um, I told him what we were doing and told him he needed to come back. And uh, I said to him, I want to close the city of London airport. We've done. Uh, is that all right? And he said, sure, sure. So I got cover there. But he then said, but what, where's Bush? What is he doing? What is his reaction going to be? How do we influence him? Who's done this? Because it, we were a long way from knowing who'd done it. And, you know, there were so many stories about what was going on in government at that time. Uh, and the agencies were actually furiously trying to find out what was lay behind it. They got there very quickly, by the way. They were there by the time he got back, Al-Qaeda, and they, they weren't certain, but they had a high probability. And, and the Foreign Office, too. And we then, and of course, in the middle of all that, real life intervened. We just set up a new unit to deal with con big contingencies and, and to deal with them. Um, uh, watching the world and uh, and moving quickly. Uh, and um, they were up in easing world, bonding at the moment when we needed them. And the people who were in charge of COBRA were on a coach on the way to Hereford uh, to um, bond with the SAS. We had to make the coach turn around and come back. And we, I was opening, there's, there are lots of tunnels under Whitehall. I was opening one of them in case we needed a rapid exit. And the man who had the key to the tunnel was on holiday and nobody knew where the, where he, where the key had been put, where he kept the key. So, or, and the switchboard went down. We had a new switchboard went down. So he had to use an outside line. I, I've always learnt, actually, from the storm, crucial to have an outside line if you're dealing with crises. Because it, it, if you rely on switchboards or you're in a mob your mobile may not work because everyone's re using the their mobiles, and, and switchboards have a way of going down at the wrong moment. Always have a single outside line which you can use. And um, we then had the meeting. It is extraordinary how people rallied. They came to COBRA, people, you know, uh, from all sorts of bits of government, including the people I recognised as having dealt with foot and mouth. Ministers turned up. I can remember Gordon Brown coming. I can remember Jack Straw coming. Uh, and then Tony Blair we arrived back. We went and uh, I went with Stephen Lander, uh, and we briefed him what was where we got to, and he went down and he took over the meeting. And he was very good. He dealt quickly with the domestic, and there were all sorts of domestic issues, like if there was a plane flying which had been hijacked and was flying in to do damage into central London, does someone shoot it down because it's got passengers on it, uh, and who takes that decision? It was a very fr frightening moment, which we, we, which uh, needed thinking about. Uh, and similarly, um, uh, uh, we had to think about the uh, international consequences of it. And Blair was instantly into the big picture, as he would call it. And I can remember Jack Straw saying, this is a day that's going to change history. This is an afternoon that is really historical. And we had, they had a very good first discussion about how to manage it and what they needed to know, and what action, and there was a list of actions. It was a long list, which we jotted down for, for the Prime Minister. And he got on top of it. But getting the machine organised and rallied and alert and not panicking, one of the things that goes wrong in a crisis, uh, 
is that people run around like headless chickens unless you're careful. And they need to know, they need to have something to hold on to, to remember from their training or from their rehearsals what their job was. And people need to know who is in charge and to know what they had to do. And if you've got people who are alert and even though they didn't expect this crisis, they know how you behave in crises and they don't behave like headless chickens. Richard, when you talk through a crisis like that, you it's multi-layered, it's complex. And when people find things aren't working in the way they should, of course, uh, that's going to happen in a crisis, but it's not ideal. How much testing, whether on a mass scale or in component parts, did government do uh, in advance of these big crises? Government has been continuously committing some resources to contingency planning, to my certain knowledge, for since the mid-70s, over 40 years. And in the 80s, when I went into the Cabinet Office, there was a civil contingencies unit which had a cupboard full of pieces of paper which set out what each department thought were the main crises they needed to be prepared for, uh, who was the lead department, which would be in charge of taking the main action and coordinating it across government, uh, and um, how would it be expected to develop over what period of time and what action and resources would they need to take. And a lot of the plans were quite similar. Quite often, the response has to be local and it would involve voluntary bodies, the police, the fire service, the ambulance service and so on. And they are all involved and departments were in charge of rehearsing their own, having their own rehearsals from time to time to make sure their plans were relevant and up to date. And the Cabinet Office is always, it has overall charge of making sure that departments have those plans and also of having exercises from time to time, uh, which actually try as close as you can to real life to practice. So you would have people given roles, you'd have a scenario, you'd have meetings of COBRA, you'd have someone running in to the meetings and saying, this has just happened, and people would have to adjust their behaviour and their decisions to take account of them. That is all regular and routine in government, and quite an important part of preparation. And there used to be a school in um, Easing World in Yorkshire, which was dedicated to uh, training and to practising scenarios and thinking through them. I don't know if it's probably been overtaken now. But so there's, there's always been a bit of a resource. Um, the trouble is that the actual crises that departments prepare for are never the actual crises that occur. But they're still very important because what you do is give people a sense of who's in charge, how they behave, what are the things to remember, and what are the lessons that you've learned from your training, so that um, when it actually happens, you, you after the first minute of, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? You remember what you're going to do, and you remember what you're, you've been told you have to do. And the Cabinet Office, if they, and it is a job of the people in the Cabinet Office officials to coordinate and pull this together and to give a lead and to make sure the Prime Minister, who's in charge of the government, is happy and knows what you're up to, which is why we, one of the things we did in ringing Mr. Blair to report to him where we were, in case he or she wants to give a, a steer. Now, you've seen so much in your time in government. Uh, what are the big crises learnings you've taken from your experience that may be applicable to business leaders listening to this interview today? First of all, uh, be prepared. That's not to say you know what's going to happen for particular crises. Indeed, one of the rules I've learned is that if you prepare for a particular crisis, it won't happen. So that we put huge resources, my fault, into preparing for the millennium bug. And on the night of the New Year's Eve, we had, I think it was 500 people with, with computers in a warehouse ready for planes to fall out of the sky and so on. And nothing happened because we put such effort into it. There was no crisis. But the crisis, what you need to do is to ensure that people um, have training, rehearsal for a crisis. And you identify who's in the lead in a crisis. 
and if there are different sorts of crises, the different people who are in the lead. You must have everybody's home addresses and phone numbers. You do not want to send a card to collect someone and find you don't know where they live. And you don't want to spend time finding mobile numbers. And we used to have, it still falls out of my bookcases. This is bits of paper, large, thick bundles of paper with who's in the lead, who uh, have particular responsibilities, where they live and what, they're, what, the, what number to ring. It's very delicate to ask people for this information, but you have to have it because in a crisis, you don't want to spend time putting it together. You have to know who's in charge of communication. Uh, my, my experience, if you have different people giving their own story to the press, they won't be the same story. They will conflict. You need a strong person in charge of communications who can tell, um, can, can control them and can tell the story to the press. You need to get your timing right. The first information you have in a crisis is almost always partially wrong. You mustn't go public with it until you know for sure you've got confirmation that what you're saying is true. Because if you say this is happening and then you're wrong and you change your story, people lose trust in you. You've got to be pretty astute in working out what to say and when and who's going to say it. You need to have strong leadership. If there's a crisis, you don't want someone to be so busy with their work that they say, don't bother me if they're at the top of the organisation. You want people at the top to know what a crisis, and I mean one that affects a wider community, is, is happening, and to drop everything when they've got a real crisis, as Tony Blair dropped everything on 9-11. And he was actually giving quite an important speech to the TUC, but he dropped everything and came, and we, we were, it was in it for, well, actually for months, because it led to Afghanistan. And you need to have um, in a room where you know everybody will meet, a room which is a kind of everybody knows this is where we go to because the temptation to run around like a headless chicken is strong and it's good, gives people something to hold on to. If you say at random almost, we will have a meeting at 4.30 or whatever the time is, you choose it and everyone then knows what they're working to. Uh, and it has to be a room equipped with a landline that goes out and doesn't go through a switchboard because otherwise you're cut off at the moment when you need actually a lot of landlines in the Cobra, which we re-equipped in my time. And you need to have knowledge inside your business who is in charge of this particular aspect of it because different crises require leadership and that they know that they're in the lead and they don't hide or try and pass it on to someone else. If you trigger it, they need to know they're now in charge and they're on the spot. And they then need to know where they're going, who their team is in dealing with it and, uh, and how they're going to communicate with their staff. Communication internally is, is also very important. It, it's no good having a brilliant statement to the world, to the press. In people inside the organisation have no idea what's going on or what's expected of them. So internal communication is as crucial as external communication. You need to give people a lead so that they know where they're going. Those are great lessons, Richard. Really, really strong for people listening today. Now, how, when you were in the crises that you just talked us through, whether it was 9-11 or others, how did you take a moment to get a clear head, to think things through? Because when you're running from meeting to meeting and trying to coordinate people, you don't always get time to do that. How did you do it? Now, you, you, that's very insightful of you. It's true. If you're in, thrown suddenly into a crisis, your adrenaline runs, uh, you, you, you've got the energy and the concentration to think of the things you have to do. But you do privately need a moment in which to just say to yourself, what's going on? Take a deep breath. And I believe in breathing. I can remember one occasion Going, we had a we had a number of meeting rooms in the cabinet office. Finding an empty meeting room and just standing there and breathing, you know, breathe in to the count of eight, hold it for eight, breathe out to eight. Now, what are we going to do? This is a problem, and what have we not done? And what's the next step? And then go back and be good again with your staff because people are watching you. One of the problems of being in the kind of posts I've been in, everybody watches you. Everybody looks to see. And actually, 
and this may sound inappropriate, but if you get it right, it's not. Jokes can be helpful. I mean, you know, keep some sense of humour, sense of proportion, shows you're all right. People need to know that people in leaderships at the top are not falling to pieces or panicking themselves. And if you can make a silly joke, um, actually, everybody else relaxes and, and performs better. And I don't mean, you know, a story about an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman. I just mean um, some sort of, you know, a, a ironic or comic remark about what's going on that just gives everyone a signal that although what we're dealing with is really serious, we are competent and confident and in control. And we can actually, a bit of us that tightens in a panic can relax. Well, well, actually, Richard, you've just set out a number of rules that you would advise people to uh, take and follow should they be suffering for fight or flight. So the breathing, a big part of that, the taking a moment to wait and also signaling that everyone is actually OK and you're doing that through humour. And those things are incredibly important in leadership roles across the board, not just in crises. Now, uh, before we finish up, Richard, prime ministers are always in the news. Do we help prime ministers enough? when they're in post and after they leave? Or is it the case that they don't want to be helped? I, sh I, I may be in a minority on this. I have for a long time, a very long time, been in favour of training for ministers and for people in opposition who may become ministers. And this, there's an organisation called the Institute for Government who I am strongly supportive of. I don't have much to do with them now, but I think they, are, they have known them do training. For, for opposition people. Because when ministers come into government, they have a steep learning curve. You can equip them to look as if they're in charge from day one. The reality behind the scene is like everybody else doing something new, it takes them at least a year, or, or you know, quite often understandably longer, to get into the role and to understand it and to know how to do it. And that is particularly true of the role of prime minister. And it's particularly true of people who come to that role without having really been trained through ministerial jobs for a longish period. When Mr. Blair came to power in 1997, there were 109 ministers and only, I think, half a dozen, I can't remember, less than that, had ever been in or near government before. And very few of them had been in a top managerial position let alone a government department in the eye of the press. And they suddenly found themselves surrounded by these suited civil servants, asking them to take decisions and being very polite and giving advice. And no friends other than people in the centre of government, like Alistair Campbell, who'd been, as it were, moving them around for announcements, um, and their own special advisers, two of whom they were allowed to. And, I, and Mr Blair and Mr Brown and Mr Mandelson, remember, came into power never having been worked in government before. And they were too similarly, and though Mr Blair was very good at the public image and, and they did their best, they were working out how to behave in government. I think my time as cabinet secretary was actually when the Blair, the Blair years, when everybody was learning the job behind the scenes. And I actually introduced, attempted to introduce training for ministers because training is a good potted way of transferring experience to people. And um, we introduced training courses and training events. We did, a, and they worked quite well at the beginning. We had a training event I did with Jack Straw. We organized um, where we looked at a problem which should have been the IT failure system in, uh, in, in the um, passport office and worked out the officials and all people from government who'd been involved and ministers and had a discussion about what had gone wrong, what were the lessons we should learn. And actually, the main outcome was trust. Ministers have to trust their officials and officials have to trust their ministers uh, if you're going to be, uh, deal with a sudden IT crisis which disrupts your business. And we, we had a number of those. And we then had training sessions, which were mainly attended by junior ministers, about how to deal with your civil servants, how to deal with your permanent secretary, how to deal with your private office, what are your rights, 
What are the things we expect from you? What are the values? What are the rules that you have to observe? What are the traps that you could fall into if you didn't know they were there? And they were very popular. We had rooms full of people sitting on little gold chairs. Um, and you'll find references to these in some of the diaries which have now been published. And I hope they were useful. But then we got, I got more ambitious and started having proper training courses uh, with proper outsiders coming in to give ministers rapid build-up in things that they might not know about, like economics or financial conflicts, businesses. And um, number 10 heard about this. I said to them, I'm doing it. And I showed it to them. And the decision that came back was, no, don't let's go this far, because it looks as though ministers are inexperienced and not on top of it, uh, and it would give a bad message about the competence of the government. Actually, it was, a, and I understand that. So there's a real problem, and I think you need to give people, politicians, training long before they get into power so that they are equipped to do the job a bit more. I mean, it may not be exactly right, but it may give them some idea. And it also enables them to understand the ministers they're dealing with, because sometimes the questions they ask show that they don't actually understand how government works and they don't, they're not as effective as they ought to be. Richard, what I think I, you're here saying very clearly there is prevention is better than cure. And if you train people up, you prevent issues arising rather than having to cure them after they have. Richard, that's a great place to end. You have been a stellar guest today uh, and have had an amazing career over the years. And I feel very privileged to have heard just a small segment of it uh, today. Thank you for your sage insight and for what has been a fantastically fascinating conversation. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did uh, recording it with Richard. I'm joined again by Karen White uh, and Gary Cleland uh, to talk about what we just heard. Hi, Gav. Hi, Gav. Now, I, I really could have chatted all day to Richard. In fact, our brilliant producer, Steph, and I ended the interview suggesting to him that he should get his life experience down on paper or recorded in some way, as it's so vitally important for historical records. And he is in a fantastically engaging individual. Now, towards the end, he set out an eight-point manifesto for business leaders thinking about crises. He talked about the need to be prepared uh, and have systems in place to ensure you're prepared, to have contact details for everyone to hand, something which may seem odd, but trust me, not every organization has this, to have strong communications leadership in the room, directing it and being control freaks about the message, to ensure you get the timing right of when you go proactively out and when you don't. He talked about strong and focused overall leadership, and he referenced Tony Blair during the 9-11 crises and his role in that. He also talked about the crisis room and bringing people together, and also making sure who is in charge of delegated responsibilities and having clarity on that. And then finally, he talked about internal communications being as important as external communications in a crisis, something I know we'll all agree with. Those are fantastic rules for us all to follow. And for those thinking the need for landlines, which is something Richard mentions a few times, is dated. Trust me, you'd be amazed how many times mobile networks go down in a crisis, often on purpose as a result of policing and intelligence needs at the time. Gary, has Richard missed anything on that fantastic list that business leaders should add? I don't know if he's missed anything, but perhaps two things which could come under be prepared. I, I think it's worth pulling out. First is test your processes. Uh, it's obvious, but there's a difference between writing down a, a crisis protocol and, and living through a crisis. Um, and proper as live simulations will throw up all sorts of little issues or niggles, even things as simple as having the correct tech in the room that can be missed in a theory, but can make a big difference um, whenever you are actually facing a crisis. And so it's important to test regularly. And second, learn the lessons uh, when you do go through a crisis and have a process in place to enable you to do that. Um, I always think the way to do it is, is the hot wash and, and cold wash. So get feedback from across the board as close to the issue as possible when people are still experiencing the process. And then secondly, a little later, take a more strategic look at whether the response met the needs of the organization. And that way, you're able to learn 
tactical, logistical lessons, as well as review the strategic approach. Too many businesses, understandably, uh, can't wait to move on when they think the issue is behind them. But actually, that moment is when they can learn the best lessons that can set them up and make them more resilient for the next one. Good additions, Gary. What about you, Karen? Anything to add? Yeah, I thought it was a really solid list. And, you know, most of the examples that came to mind for me were building on the principles that Richard had outlined. Uh, I think one of the areas, though, that I do try to remember is the importance of taking care of people in the response, particularly in a sustained crisis, making sure you're appropriately resourced and there's replacements to cover people off. You know, when you're in the heat of the crisis, it can be really hard for people to step away, but working 24 seven, it just isn't sustainable. And so making sure you're building a schedule for people to cover each other off and give people breaks, making sure people are fed, um, getting sleep, you know, I think that can be just as important as the responses itself. I think the other focus area that I heard too is the importance of after action reporting, which Gary mentioned, which is brilliant, um, but also the importance of good transitions in your response. So making sure that key decisions are recorded, that the person coming in and covering you is aware of the planning cycle, the key actions and the deliverables that are required. And also if you're coming into a ship, generally I like to see people shadow someone for a couple of hours so that you get a sense of the ebb and flow of the response, how the team is interacting and who is tasked with what deliverables as part of the active response. Some great additions again there, Karen. The only thing I would add to all of that, and I think it's implicit in terms of strong leadership and focused leadership is just agreeing an overall objective for what you're seeking to achieve with the crises, because that provides the direction of travel on everything. And if you've got the objective right, you'll get the crises right. So that's us for another week. I hope you enjoyed the podcast and the glimpse that Richard has given us to the heart of power during an extraordinary crisis. Until next time, thank you for listening to White Swan, the crisis podcast. Stay safe. White Swan is brought to you by Hanover Communications and its global crisis network. To find out more, please visit hanovercoms.com. That's Hanover, H-A-N-O-V-E-R, comms, C-O-M-M-S dot com. Thank you.